Okay, hello everyone. My name is Jasmine. Hi everyone, my name is Raya and I'm so excited to uh, be joined by all of you today. We also have Will helping us out in the background here and Carly as well. So we've got a little bit of a team. Now, uh, Jasmine and I and Will and Carly, we all work for an organization called the Toronto and Region Conservation Authority. Um, so we all teach, we all educate about the environment because I'll show you the, our little logo here. So the Toronto and Region Conservation Authority, we're trying to conserve natural aspects of the world, right, and make sure that the uh, nature that supports us and that we're living in is healthy and uh, we're trying to protect it. So today is part of that as well. Um, now, we have been working with a Nature Canada who has a program called Naturehood. And this is what today is all about. The idea with the Naturehood program, and there'll be a link in the chat if you want to read a little more about it, um, is that it's trying to connect people who live in urban spaces like cities, right, with the natural environment around us, with urban nature. So that's what we're doing today. Um, now, if you have a question throughout the live stream, you can put it in the chat. And we'll have a question period at the end. It might be answered during, it might be answered um, at the question period at the end. But by all means, you can put questions in the chat. Um, you can put comments. Just make sure that they're appropriate to what we're talking about. And I wanted to mention, at the end, I'll talk about this more. But there is a worksheet after the live stream if you're interested. So um, without further ado, then, I'm going to turn it over to Jasmine to get us started. Great. Thank you so much, Raya. So hello, everyone. To, what I would like to welcome you to our Become a Nature Champion live stream. So today's live stream is all about becoming a nature champion. So what does this mean? Well, I like to think of it as a way to become a spokesperson for nature and to advocate for nature. And one way to do that is to guide others in your life, whether it be your friends or your family or members of your community, to explore nature and appreciate nature from a new perspective. And that's what we're going to be learning about today. And that's what we're going to be, you know, practicing. So to start us off here, we are going to talk about five big ideas. And these big ideas are going to help us guide others and see nature from a different perspective. I'm going to show you the space I'm in right now. So I am in this beautiful wilderness space. We are going to explore this space a little bit and think about some of these five big ideas. Okay, so let's get exploring. Now, the first big idea I want to talk about is color. So as I'm looking around, I am seeing a few different colors. And I really like to draw our attention to this one, because I think a lot of people think in the winter, you know, there's not a lot of color. But if we look closer, we can find color everywhere. I'm looking down at the snow and I'm seeing a bright white. I can see orange from some leaves that have fallen. If I look up, up, up all the way, I can see green from some of our trees that still have leaves on them. And if I'm looking at this stem here, I can see it's this very kind of dark purple, almost red color. So if we look a little bit closer, even in the winter, we can see that there's color everywhere. And that can help us kind of focus in on some aspects of this natural space that we're in. Okay, we're going to keep exploring. And the next big idea that I want to share with you is shapes. So as we're looking around in this space, we can kind of think about what shapes we can see. Now I'm looking at this branch here and I can see it's creating some Y shapes spreading out into the sky. I'm looking at the trees over there and I can picture that their trunks almost look like cylinders. And over here, I think I found what looks like a bird nest. And in this bird's nest, we can see it creates almost a circle, circular shape. So by looking at the colors and shapes, these are really simple ways to start thinking about our natural space and start, you know, paying more attention to it and paying more attention to some of the details that we can find there. Okay, we're going to dig a little deeper now and shift our perspective um, in a new way. And we're going to do that by thinking about our third big idea, which is relating. So relating means looking at pieces of nature and relating them to pieces of your own life. And I'm going to do that by looking at 
this plant that we can see here. So this plant is called burdock. And this is what it looks like in the summer. So it looks like that in the summer. And when I look at burdock, I almost think of it as sea urchins. I can almost picture the bottom of an ocean with a bunch of little spiky sea urchins kind of all over. And I forgot to mention, as I'm going through these big ideas and as I'm exploring this space, I want you to share in the chat what you see as well. So what colors do you see? What shapes do you see? What does this plant, what does this common burdock make you think of? How can you relate it to your own life? And I actually have another plant here that I want to share with you. And this plant is called Queen Anne's Lace. When I look at Queen Anne's Lace, I almost see something like a firework. I can see kind of a firework bursting up out of the ground. Um, someone shared with me that they see almost a whisk shape so they can relate it to a whisk that they might find in their kitchen. And in the summer, you may have seen it before, Queen Anne's Lace looks like that. It's this beautiful white, almost like an umbrella that kind of stretches out. Amazing. So our third big idea is all about relating and relating nature and making that connection between nature and our own lives. We're going to go through the forest a little bit here and we're going to explore. And I'm noticing I'm coming into a more forested area and it's a little bit muddy. So I am slipping a little bit. I'm going to come down here. And I'm looking up at these trees. And I'm thinking about our fourth big idea, which is all about value. So value is a little bit different. And it means kind of the value that pieces of nature provide for other living things, other plants or animals around it. And a tree is a perfect example of that. When we're thinking about the value that a tree provides, well, oh, I see a perfect example of that right here. So down at the bottom of the tree, I can see what looks like a walnut, but the nut inside has actually been chewed up. I wonder if any of you have ideas of what animal might have eaten the nut out of this walnut. I also see a cone here, and we can see the top of the cone is still intact, but it looks like the bottom of the cone has just been chewed up by some kind of animal. So we can see that this tree is, has value in providing food for some animals in this space. If I look very, very high, I can also see up there is what we call a dray, which is a squirrel's nest. So I know that this tree is providing shelter and a home for some animals as well. Okay. We're going to come out kind of into this clearing here and let's see what else we can find in this space. Okay, I'm looking down at the ground and oh my gosh, here I can see what looks like an animal track. And it looks like this animal only has two toes. Can anyone guess what kind of animal this might be? So while I'm looking at this animal track, I'm thinking of our fifth big idea, which is imagination. So by using our imagination, we can kind of imagine what animal might have created this track and how that animal might see this space. Now, I happen to know, know and maybe some of you may have guessed as well, that this animal is a white-tailed deer. So we can we know that a white-tailed deer has been here in this space, and we can imagine how they might see their surroundings. So maybe they're looking for food, maybe they're looking for shelter, but by using our imagination, kind of putting ourselves in the minds of an animal, we can view our natural space from an entirely new perspective. Okay, so we have just talked about five big ideas. Those ideas are color, shape, 
relating, value, and imagination. So using these big ideas, we can look at nature more closely and kind of focus our attention to different pieces in nature and change our perspective of it and change others' perspectives as well. We're actually going to go over to Raya, who is going to show us how to use these five big ideas and more in an urban space and how to guide others. You just have to unmute your mic, Raya. Sorry, everybody. <laughs> Rookie mistake, didn't unmute my mic. So you might be thinking to yourself, okay, Jasmine was in this wilderness space and she's saying we can be a nature champion by guiding others through um, the natural world. But I live in the city and there are streets and sidewalks and buildings all around me. How can I do this in the city? So that's what we're going to do now. We're going to see if we can put into play some of these big ideas that Jasmine mentioned in an urban space. So I'll be taking you on an urban nature tour. We're going to find the beauty in the city when it comes to the natural components of it. Um, maybe we'll see if we can figure out some stories that some of these natural aspects can, can tell us and find ways that we can connect with the natural spaces that we are a part of, or part of nature too, right? Before we do that, we always like to know kind of who's watching, who's with us today. So um, there is a straw poll link going into the chat. And what that means, it's just a link. If you can click on that, there's one question. Um, and if you can just select, are you a teacher watching with your students right now? Or are you maybe a homeschooling parent watching with your children? Or are you an individual who's watching just out of interest? Um, that really helps us to know who's joined us today. That would be great. So clicking on that link, it takes about five seconds. And then... Uh, Come back to us. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you for, um, for submitting your answer on that poll. It really helps us out. OK, so let's get started on our urban nature tour as I guide you through my neighborhood so that you can kind of get these ideas going for how you can guide somebody else in your neighborhood and be a nature champion. I'm just going to turn the camera off me here. And I'm going to try to avoid getting any members of the public because I am on a public street. And I want to start by something that I notice here are that we have a lot of trees and we're really lucky in Toronto to have so many trees in our urban space. We have a climate that allows for all these trees to grow. And as I look up, I can see the tree crowns. That's the top part of the tree. Um, in the winter, especially, or like this late winter season, the crowns of trees have a really cool shape to them. And I kind of, from an artistic perspective, I think they're really elegant and really lovely how the branches kind of swoop up and how they divide. There's a lot going on there. Something I'd like to focus on as well, since we have so many different trees here, are the, is the tree bark. So let's compare a few different types of tree bark. There's this one that looks like it's a bit patchy. And I happen to know that this tree is um, naturally like this, which is super cool. My scientific brain always wants to get right into what species we're talking about, but today is really about different perspectives. You can talk about science if you want when you're doing a nature walk, absolutely. Um, but I'm trying to broaden my own horizons and look at things from another perspective. Now, comparing to this tree, this has really smooth bark with some little um, white spots on it. And if I was, you know, guiding people, I might say, okay, these are lentil soles. They're like breathing holes for the tree. Um, but we can just admire the fact that this is like a, almost like a polka dot tree. If you were talking to somebody younger, you could say, look, it's like you're connecting the dots, just like when you're doing um, activities in your activity books. Oh, check out this bark. So many different types of bark on this one street. So this bark is really flaky. It almost looks like Gosh, maybe cornflakes, <laughs> relating it to cornflakes. So there's another appearance to some tree bark. And I think there's just one more, maybe two more I want to show you on this street. They're all so different. I can't, it's hard to stop, you know? I just love these trees. This one actually is super cool. It kind of looks like a labyrinth. And all these lines, the way the bark goes down, they create this idea of like mazes on the tree bark and you can just imagine if it's a little insect that's crawling in the maze 
Um, think about it from their perspective, right? Imagine you're a little insect or a human in a massive tree bark <laughs> crawling along. Now, the last tree, I did lie. There are two more. So this is the last one now. This one, I actually wanted to point out other parts of the tree. The twig of the tree is unique because it has these little bumps on it. I'll try to keep it in focus with my hand behind it. So it has these little bumps on it. So even in winter, I can tell right away what kind of tree this is. This one is called a ginkgo tree. And it's actually from another part of the world, but it does tolerate pollution pretty well. So it grows in Toronto, grows in New York City, grows all over, all kinds of cities. And what's so cool about ginkgo trees, it's not invasive, it's non-native, but it's not invasive, so it's not a problem. Um, what's so cool about them is their leaves. So I've come down to the ground. Have you ever seen a leaf with that shape? What does this remind you of? They kind of have this fan-shaped leaf. And the ginkgo tree is the only tree that has a leaf that is this shape. Keep your eyes open for these. This is actually a really historic tree. And um, when I'm doing a nature, when I'm guiding a nature tour, then sometimes I ask the people I'm guiding, do you know anything about this tree or what do you think about it? And in this case, when Jasmine and I were going for a walk, then she shared with me that this tree has a lot of, it's a really, really ancient tree. So it's really old, um, genetically speaking, that it looks prehistoric because it kind of is. So there's a lot of stories there. My story that I know about the ginkgo tree is that chefs in New York City sometimes might use the, the uh, stinky pulp to make meals. So we are crossing a sidewalk area here. Oops, and I'm trying to avoid showing cars. There we go. And we've got a bit of an open space just off the street next to some homes, next to a parking area. We are going to imagine that we are another type of animal who lives in the city and how they might see this space. So if you are a bird, maybe you're swooping along and you're looking for a place to land. So you're swooping along the, the expanse here and you're keeping your eyes on the branches to land on. Maybe if you are a squirrel, you're running on the ground, keeping your eyes on places that you can climb up. So you might climb up this tree go on to the one branch and then jump over to the next tree. Oh, that's quite a leap, but I think squirrels can make it. They're pretty acrobatic. So we can explore these sorts of very straightforward spaces. Maybe you're guiding a younger brother and sister and you can get your younger brother and sister to imagine that they are these different animals who live in, urban, in, uh, in Toronto. Now I'm coming close up to this tree here because it has a cool story to tell. So let's see, I think there are a couple of things to talk about. Ah, oh, one of them is this. So if we notice these sorts of spots in trees, we can start creating a bit of a story. Like, check this out. I wonder what happened to this tree. It looks like a branch used to be here and maybe it was cut off and the tree, this bumpy part here means the tree is healing in that area. And I wonder what this tree used to look like. If the branch came all the way out to here, Maybe squirrels used to run along this branch. Maybe there were flowers growing on it in the summer. You can kind of create a story about what the tree might have, how the tree might have uh, played a role in the past. And as we look at the bark more closely, I mean, if you think about it, if you were to, if somebody asked you what color is bark, tree bark, you might say, well, it's brown. Or maybe some people might say it's gray. It's got some gray in it. We can see that there is something growing on the bark. And this, my friends, is lichen. It looks kind of like moss, that's a little bit different. And lichen is in all these different colors. So we can start thinking about the beauty of these urban spaces, given the color that we can find on tree bark. There's yellow and orange. And let's see if we come around here. Sometimes there's even blues and grays in the lichen that we can see. There's a little gray spot right there and right there, kind of bluish. So by getting up close and personal, we can um, have a different perspective on these spaces where we live, right? We can start looking at the details. I love the word minutia. It might be a new word for you. Minutia basically means the small details, like minute details. So I like looking at minutia of these natural spaces. Now I've entered into another part of this green space. 
And as you can see, there's another parking lot there. So I'm surrounded by parking lots where I am in my neighborhood here. Um, and I noticed that there's actually a bit of a planted area in the middle of all this grass. So right away that draws me in. I'm thinking, okay, what value do these shrubs provide? So if I'm guiding somebody along, I might say, okay, let's have a look. Hmm, this patch right here could actually be super valuable. We might say, well, it just looks like a patch of dead stems um, in the middle of grass, no big deal, but it can be really valuable for organisms who live in Toronto. And let's see if I can find one here. I want to show you an example of something. We've got some stems. And again, you're like, oh my gosh, she keeps talking about stems, all these dead stems. What's the big deal? Well, oh, here it is. Perfect. Notice this one. Dead stem. But let's have a look at the top. Here we have a hole. And this is like a tunnel, essentially. So this plant, and I get it in focus, there we go. This plant has a really soft center in the stem, which when it sort of decomposes away because it's so soft, it leaves a tunnel behind. And there is a particular organism that loves finding these. I'm gonna ask you a question. If you were, when you think about bees and where they live, what do you call a bee home? Most people probably say hive. Well, it is true that a lot of bees live in hives. That's what I learned as well. Um, but there are a lot of trees that actually don't live in hives and they might be flying around this kind of space. So we're flying, flying, and they see a tunnel like this, a hole like this, and they're like, oh, bingo, this is what I want. They will bring some pollen down the stem and make a little pollen ball and lay an egg down at the bottom there. They'll fly out. Maybe they'll collect some leaves or grasses or mud and bring that in and seal off that space they made. So it's like they're creating a room for their egg and they put the pollen in. So when the egg hatches, the larva has something to eat. And then they fly out again, find some more pollen, bring it in, bring the pollen in, lay another egg, seal it off, lay another egg. And all along this tunnel, there are rooms for baby bees. And so, Will, if you can show the picture of the bees, um, there are so many different types of bees on this planet and about 20,000 different species, different types actually are solitary bees and they need tunnels like this. And um, Will, if you'd like to show the other one, the other picture, that's great. So the tunnels from the inside, you can actually see at the top there, there are different cells. And that one looks like there's a bunch of pollen in that top picture. On the bottom, that bee used leaves to make their cells, whereas the top was more like muddy. In the middle picture, that long one in the middle, you can see there are all these pupa. So after the egg hatched, the larva ate the, um, the larva ate the pollen, and then the larva transformed into a pupa, and then they'll transform into an adult. And on the bottom right, there is an adult coming out. So thank you, Will, so much for sharing all that. So this, this stem here has quite a story if you start learning a little bit more about how nature interacts with itself, how different parts of nature interact with each other. But looking at it like this, you might think, how am I going to guide somebody through that experience? You can just kind of, like, if you know the stories, that's great. Otherwise, you can, again, get into the shapes and colors and think about, okay, what do these remind me of? What are some relationships I might have with what I'm seeing? So, We've talked about, um, we've given some examples of how you can relate to natural spaces. And I just wanted to play, oops, sorry about that, guys. I just wanted to play a little bit of a game with you. Because I know that if I'm guiding people who are younger than me, um, or actually adults like games too. Who are we kidding? Adults love games. So if, if I'm guiding a group, it's, it's really fun to kind of throw a game in there to break things up a little bit. And the first game, actually the only game we'll do right now, <laughs> is called Human Camera. The way it would work if you're guiding somebody is, or guiding a group, is that people pair up. And let's say you're playing this with your parents. So um, maybe you just you and your mom are out for a walk, or you and your grandma, and you get them to close their eyes. And you think about what you want to direct their attention to. And then um, you get them to maybe say, okay, step to the left, Two more steps, 
step forward, bend down a little bit, and I'm going to go one, two, three, click. And when I say click, you open your eyes, and then I'll say click again to close your eyes. So we're going to try this, see if this game makes sense to you, if I show you an example. And I'm going to cover your eyes, and let me just orient my camera here. We're going to, I'm going to guide you somewhere, so you're Imagining you're taking some steps forward, lowering your head, and everybody say it with me. One, two, three, click. Ready? One, two, three, click. And click. So you were a little camera, and you maybe noticed something you didn't notice before. I'm going to take you somewhere else, and we'll play again. So on three. One, two, three, click. One, two, three, click. <laughs> So this is, in that case, we were seeing that lichen up close, right? The lichen I showed you earlier. But if, if you haven't talked about lichen yet, as you're walking around, people might not expect to really notice that lichen. So it's kind of a new perspective. Now, there's one other um, thing that I like to do when I'm out in a natural space. Ah, who am I kidding? I sometimes do this at home, too. Um, but we'll do it out here. We're at the beginning point again of where I started when I first said hi to you. And this is that I like to sometimes take a moment um, and just really appreciate where I am. I call these mindfulness moments. So I'll find a spot where I feel comfortable and you can stand or you can sit for this, whatever makes the most sense for you. And I will close my eyes and I'll just take some deep breaths. You can do this with me. So I'm gonna ask you to you're, you know, imagining you're sitting at the base of this spruce tree. And I'm going to ask you all to close your eyes with the image of the spruce tree in mind. And take some deep breaths in. So everybody breathe in. Really fill your lungs and breathe out. Breathe in again. And breathe out. And I'm going to stay quiet this time. Let's see if you can hear any of the sounds that I can hear. So we'll be quiet for just a moment with our eyes closed, imagining the spruce tree and listening and breathing deep. Okay, you can open your eyes. That was a really short one. Usually I do it for longer. Um, so I'm not sure if you were able to hear some of the birds that are in this area. Um, I heard a little bit of uh, foot traffic as well, kind of adding to the mosaic of sound here. Um, so a mindfulness moment, it can be a lot of other different things. I find the deep breathing really helps to kind of settle our minds and get us into the moment so we can carefully listen and kind of feel that space that we're in. Um, and it's, I really like to find little corners like next to a, a public garden or something to uh, do a mindfulness moment in. Um, so, the last thing I want to talk about before I turn you back over to Jasmine is the idea of stewardship, environmental stewardship. So stewardship is, what that word means is kind of like taking care of something that doesn't necessarily belong to you. And environmental stewardship is where we're talking about the environment. So the environment doesn't belong to us. The environment helps us survive, but it doesn't, we don't own it, right? But we do need to all take care of it. And there are lots of different ways that you can be an environmental steward, um, you know, uh, reusing things, reducing things like that, maybe picking up litter. Another way, though, is what we're talking about today, which is by helping other people connect to the natural world. So being a nature champion by guiding others through their urban natural spaces. And um, the what we're trying to do today is encourage you, get you thinking about how can I be a nature champion by guiding others? I really want other people to connect with their natural spaces because we know that if you connect with something, then you kind of care for that thing more, right? And if we care for nature more, if we're connecting with nature more and we care for it more, then hopefully we'll be able to protect it more. We'll be more motivated to protect it. So, um, so what we've talked about today are different ways, different big ideas you can use to guide others through natural spaces to build that connection. And I'm going to turn it back over to Jasmine because she actually has a special kind of exciting little part of this project um, to, to tell you about. 
Amazing. Thank you so much for guiding us through your urban space, Raya. It was so great to see some of your big ideas, some of our big ideas put into action. Um, and now I'm so excited to announce our Become a Nature Champion Challenge. So throughout this live stream, we've learned so many different skills for how to get outside and how to see nature from a different perspective and how to help others appreciate nature as well. And this challenge is all about that. So we encourage you over the next few weeks to get outside and to have a really special experience out in nature, whether alone or hopefully with maybe your family, um, and then to document that experience. So you can take uh, a photo while you're outside. Maybe you can create a drawing or write a couple sentences about how why your experience was special. Um, and then you can submit that to us. So the age group for participating in this challenge is between five years old and 16 years old. And the deadline to submit your photo or drawing or written submission is March 24th. So you can find the link to submit uh, your submission in our chat. And it's also in the description of this video. Um, once you have submitted and once the deadline is up, we will be randomly selecting a few submissions to receive some nature themed prizes. And I'm gonna show you some of the prizes that we have. So one prize that we have is the Ontario Nature Guide. You can see here, we go through all the different plants and animals. We also have this Urban Wildlife Pocket Guide. It's quite small, so it's perfect to take along on walks. We also have magnifying glasses here. And we have some native plant seeds. You can start growing some native plants. So we encourage you all to participate in our Become a Nature Champion Challenge. And we so look forward to hearing about your experiences. Thanks, Jasmine. I cannot wait to uh, hear or to read about some of the things that you have um, come up with as far as the connections you can make in your urban space. It'll be so great to uh, check out your submissions. Um, now, I wanted to mention, I mentioned the worksheet earlier, so I wanted to bring that back up again. And Will, maybe you can show the worksheet on the side if that's possible. If not, that's okay. But we have provided a worksheet. If you would like to practice um, some of these big ideas, we have a worksheet that you can use for that. There is a way to request it in the description and also in the chat, there'll be a way to request it there. Um, so you can just ask for it and we'll send it to you digitally. And um, that way it's a good way to kind of practice these ideas of, okay, what colors do I see, shapes? How can I see value in these different parts of nature, right? How can I connect with them? What relationships do I have? Um, and how can I use my imagination? Now, um, we are going to answer some questions, but if you need to go, then we wanna thank you so much for joining us today. And the live stream will be available um, in as a recording later on on YouTube. So as soon as it wraps up, you can use that same link you used to get here and um, it'll show up. But, um, so I wanna thank everybody for who, uh, who needs to go. But if you have any questions, by all means, you can put them in the chat. Maybe we'll get Will to join us to share um, if there are any questions that people have about anything we've talked about today. Yeah, definitely. Uh, there have been some really great questions that have come through. And if anybody has any more, by all means, please put them in the chat for us and we can ask them to our uh, Raya and Jasmine. So our first question that we have was, why do trees lose their leaves? Jasmine, do you want to take this one? Raya, you got it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, um, that's a really great question. And as you can see, the tree behind me still has its leaves. We call them needles, but they're still leaves. So broadleafed trees, like the ginkgo I showed you earlier, um, oaks and maples and willows, these sorts of leaves that have broader leaves than needles, they lose their leaves because um, if the leaf was to stay on the tree in the winter, well, what would happen to the water in that leaf? It would freeze, right? And the leaf would probably break. And then the tree is exposed because of the broken leaf, it's exposed to the elements, to the cold, and it's kind of a risk for the tree. So the tree's like, you know what, I'm gonna drop these leaves, I'll make new ones next year, it's less risky. I have these big broad leaves that um, have a lot of water in them and, and really they would hold a lot of snow and like it might actually break my branches if the leaves get full of snow. The ones that keep their leaves, so these are coniferous, those other ones are deciduous. The coniferous trees that keep their leaves and there are so many examples I can't resist showing you. So they also make cones, right? Coniferous. Um, so 
these ones actually have something in like dissolved in the water that keeps the water from freezing at the same temperature as, as deciduous leaves would freeze. So that's why they keep their needles because they're not at so much of a risk for that kind of, uh, of an injury. And um, they also, the snow doesn't stay on them as much as it does on those big, big flat leaves. The snow can kind of come off the needles because uh, there's less surface area there. I hope that answers your question. Um, but that's why they, that's why deciduous trees lose their leaves. Yeah, no, awesome. Uh, thank you for that, Raya. Deciduous trees and coniferous trees. I'm a bit more of a fan of the coniferous trees, but that's a bit of a bias from me. I think they're pretty unique. So we definitely had another question that came along and it is how do squirrels, squirrels climb trees? How do squirrels climb trees? Oh my gosh, Jasmine, do you mind if I get into this? I get so excited about oh. squirrels. <laughs> oh yeah, no problem, go so, for it. One of the cool things about, like, people often are like, oh, moose and bear, they're such cool animals. Squirrels are so cool. We have them all across our urban spaces and they are awesome. So squirrels are actually, there's a few answers to this. Squirrels are, um, for one thing, really good mathematicians. So when they are moving around, when they're climbing, when they're jumping from tree to tree, they are doing all kinds of calculations in their mind about where they're going. So like jumping, they're calculating where they're landing and how much they have to lift their tail to act like a parachute and how much they have to move their body and twist their body so they land in the right spot. When they're climbing, then they're using the math, but they also have these long claws, like long fingernails basically, that helps them grip. And so um, these grippy fingernails, and squirrels are pretty light, they're not that heavy an animal. So um, those kinds of the math, the grippy fingernails and um, their weight all are factors that help them to climb trees. That's amazing. I didn't know it was that much into squirrels in regards to climbing trees. Uh, but yeah, math is a big part of nature, which we sometimes Huge. don't consider as much. Uh, so it's uh, pretty amazing. I think we had another question in here, and it might be a bit of a trickier one, but how many different types of trees do we have in Canada? Or maybe an estimate of how many different types of trees do we have? That, well, is a good that is a good question. I definitely don't know the answer to that. But um, even when we're looking around kind of a space like this, right? So we can see all of our trees have different leaves, um, but we can look at the different families of trees, right? So at least in this space, I know we have cedar trees. Those are the trees you can see right here. We also have spruce, pine, oak, maple. But within all these families, there are also so many different species, right? We have sugar maple, um, red maple, silver maple, there's blue spruce, white spruce. So within all these different families of trees, there are also a ton of different species. So I think the answer to that question would be, we have well, quite I'm, thinking a about my, I'm thinking about my tree identification books I have at home and how thick they are. And I would say at least several hundred species of trees in Canada. Um, but I don't want to give you a, a number specifically because it's I don't have a number in my head. I don't want to don't want to lie to you. But I would say like definitely at least several hundred species. The one I just showed you is a coniferous tree. It makes cones, even though it's the only one that actually loses its needles. So I've shown you with the bark. I showed you I think five different species, and then we came to a few different uh, needled ones here. And so I, in this nature tour in the city alone, I've shown you probably about eight or nine different tree species. Yeah, and, and these are one of the ones, too, I think I can add in about these are some of the native species we're talking about, right, in regards to different species. And I think it's we did a quick search around 150 re regards to native species, but that's not including invasive species or non-native that might be here. So it's pretty amazing. Canada there Ontario, was, though, when you did uh, your that is in uh, uh, actually Canada, native Canadian trees. Oh, so, yeah, so. Okay. But in regards to all of the trees, we have lots and lots of different types of trees. So it's pretty amazing. One of our other questions, we'll keep on the idea of trees here, is we had, well, I see a tree leaning over or I see a tree growing, it's leaning over. Why doesn't it fall if it's leaning over? That's a good right. question. And I actually, I was looking at the chat earlier and I saw that another student had um, put in kind of a response to that question. And Raya, you can definitely add on, but I think a big part of it has to do with the roots, right? So when we're looking at trees, we're only seeing really half of the entire plant. So much more goes underground. And these, some of these trees have huge roots that stretch out underground. So 
So that really acts as an anchor for these trees. So even if they're leaning over, even if they're kind of falling, their roots keep them anchored and keep them secured. And Raya, please add anything yeah, else was, you share. The roots are really the biggest part of that, of that answer. I was just gonna share that as they're growing, sometimes um, they're leaning because they have been growing toward the light. Maybe there used to be another tree that was blocking one um, direction there was like a human made structure that was blocking that uh, the growth. And so it had to grow in one direction because it was really trying to find the light. Um, and so that might describe why it might be leaning because it, it was growing towards the light. And when it was young, that was determined by something that's not there anymore. So I was just gonna add, add that piece um, to why they might be leaning sometimes. Awesome. Yeah, sometimes uh, I always think it's a mystery, but there's definitely a lot more to it in nature. Uh, awesome. So we have a, a, another question here. And getting back to our idea of squirrels, how do they find their food? How does a squirrel find its food? Jasmine, well, you Ryan, you're, you're our in-house squirrel expert, so <laughs> <laughs> go for it. All right. Um, squirrels, how do they find their food? So there are a few different things. Sometimes they kind of know where to look. So squirrels love to eat nuts and seeds. And um, maybe they're, once they learn that in a cone that there are lots of seeds available, then as they um, spot other cones, they're like, oh yeah, I know that's a, that's a good lunch buffet. Then they'll kind of um, learn where they can find these seeds. Or maybe they climb to the top of a tree and they know that a particular tree has seeds that hang. And um, so they, once they've found one, then they know the others. I think some of it's trial and error. Like, I'm just guessing here that maybe when a squirrel is young, there might be some teaching involved from an adult, but um, they might pick up a twig and try to eat it and be like, nope, no good. And they decide that in a few seconds and then they go for something else and they're like, oh, that's a good one. And then they learn what they want to eat. Um, and they would use smell as well to find things that they want to eat, uh, things that we can't smell, maybe squirrels can smell. Jasmine, I'm not sure if you have a, a, a more complete answer to that question. That's a good one. That is a good one, yeah. And I, yeah, I think what you said is is a good answer. I think they definitely rely on their senses, just like us, right? So they'd rely on sight and smell. Um, yeah, and then there is probably, you know, as mammals, I know a lot of mammals learn from their kind of, parents. So I feel like squirrels would probably do the same and kind of model their feeding behavior off of the, the feeding behavior of the squirrels around them. I know they're also really social, so they probably learn from each other in their communities as well. Awesome. Thank you for that, team. Now, I think we're going to have time for one last question here as it is almost quarter to three. And it's, uh, we've had some great questions. If we haven't answered all of the questions in the chat, myself and Carly will do our best to answer all of them in regards to typing. Those are the two people that are kind of in there as well and communicating with you. But in regards to our last question that we're going to have for Raya and Jasmine before they will sign us off for today's live stream is, what causes the beautiful colors to deciduous trees in the fall? Oh, Will, I know you one. have a good answer. Will, you have a good answer for this one, I think, right? I've heard you answer this question before. Yeah. Uh, do you want to? Do you want to take it, Will? Yeah, yeah, I can take it. I, I, I can take it here. I'll just uh, remove you two. Oh, for I can, I can answer it. Oh, okay. I can okay. answer it. So, um, so when a tree is, um, like, when the leaves are green and lovely in the spring and the summer, they're green because of chlorophyll. So the leaves have some different pigments in it, but the chlorophyll that um, basically is responsible for the photosynthesis happening, right? So these leaves are kind of eating the sunshine or they're taking the sun's energy and they're turning it into food for the plant. Um, and that process is called photosynthesis. Well, chlorophyll in the leaves does that. A chlorophyll is so kind of intense that it covers up the other pigments and makes the leaf look green. In the fall, when the tree is like, um, there's less sun up there, I think I'm gonna bring the parts of the chlorophyll. It took a lot of energy to make that chlorophyll. I'm gonna bring those chlorophyll components back into my trunk, like the nitrogen and all that. And I wanna save that for next year. And so it kind of almost um, disassembles the chlorophyll and brings it back in. And what that leaves in the leaf then are the other pigments that were there all along. And these other pigments might be yellow or red or orange. So without the chlorophyll there anymore, these other pigments 
can shine through and that's why we can see them. And we see the leaves, the leaves changing color because it's losing that green. Will, did you want to add anything to that or did I answer that as well as you usually do? Uh, yeah, I might just add in too, I think, I think a big part of it as well and, and why we see these beautiful colors is the, the natural pigment of these plants. If you take uh, some of our leaves and you actually look at them, right, during the fall, those are, we can kind of say they're true colors, right? The chlorophyll, that bright green living part of the leaf, is what gives it that color. Once it leaves, as Raya mentions, we see the natural colors of the plant. And it's pretty neat without, you know, with this process happening. You can see it in our coniferous trees, right? In Raya's image right now, and also in Jasmine image in the back. The, these trees and their leaves or needles, they're still leaves, have chlorophyll in them. The tree is just doing it in regards to surviving less light. And we can even see that Raya has there, right? A whole bunch of leaves too. It's a big process in regards to rejuvenating the soil and also other parts around the tree. So it's kind of this whole cycle and it's really important for the tree survival too. So it's awesome. It's a, it's a pretty great process. So I'm gonna pass it off to you two uh, to kind of close us out. We're, Ra, uh, Carly and I will be answering some of the questions that weren't addressed in the chat. Thank you. So all these questions you're asking everybody, they are so great. And these are all things that you could even, if you were guiding somebody on a nature walk, you could include questions that you don't know the answer to. You say, you know, you could guide people and say, well, why do you think that these trees stay green while other trees don't? And you could speculate and that's okay. It's okay if you don't know all the answers to the sciencey type questions. If you do know answers, you can share your knowledge. Um, and if you want to approach it from that artistic perspective we were talking about earlier, where you're really looking at shapes and colors and things like that, then you can absolutely do that as well or instead. Um, really, remember, we're trying to kind of connect to these aspects of nature and get other people to connect to them so they care about them more. And also, it's good for our, our mental health too, right? It, I find when I'm spending time connecting to nature, then oh, it's like a breath of fresh air. I'm just kind of relaxing all over. So I want to, on behalf of me, I'm going to thank you so much for coming today and taking part in our session. And yeah, I would love to thank everyone for their amazing questions as well. And I just want to um, remind you that the link to, to submit your uh, challenge submission is in our description. It's also in the live chat. Um, so please, if you have if you have a chance to get outside and you're able to kind of document your experience, we would love to see your submissions and some of the experiences that you're having. But thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. Bye, everyone. Thank you.